Despite its sexy new looks, the Prius and the Prius Prime have always been number cars. So let's talk about the four most important numbers for this new 2023 Prius Prime. 44, 52, 6.6, .6, and 32,350. Now let's talk about how those numbers combine to make this, quite simply, one of the best compact sedans you can buy in America. Let's be honest, very few people have ever considered the Prius to be pretty. Opinions usually ran the gamut from boring to ugly, but this Prius is neither of those things. Not only is it attractive, I think it's also elegant and restrained, something that the Prius has never been in the past. These headlight modules are definitely a defining feature with this dramatic C-shape right there that really pinches in and this wing-like profile to the front bumper as well. The headlight modules are pretty large. They actually span about 24 inches from one side to the other, and they give this that very sleek, very dramatic look as it wraps around to the side of the vehicle. Really, the only controversial element up front is the license plate bracket, but of course, if you live in most states in the US, there's gonna be a license plate there anyway. At just over 181 inches, the new Prius is right in line with the rest of the compact sedan competition, the Hyundai Elantra Hybrid, Toyota's own Corolla Hybrid, the Honda Civic doesn't have a hybrid anymore, but oddly enough, the Civic Si is going to go 0-60 to 60 about as fast as this Prius. Yes, you heard that right. Civic Si and Prius in 0-60 to 60 head to head battles. That's something that I want to see. But you'll notice that the profile is quite different than the competition. We have this very dramatic, very low slung hood. It's just above the knee right there at the front. And the practically same angle that's going on with the hood just goes right up there to the windshield. Very low roof line. It is definitely lower than Priuses of the past, as is this rear end design here. And that has reduced practicality in the cargo area versus Priuses of yore. This is still a hatchback, so it's not technically a sedan, even though in this generation, it certainly looks more sedan-like. Up front, we find pretty traditional door handles. Back here, we find electronic door handles integrated into this trim section there. Really, the only change on the side is gonna be this charge door right here, where we find the J1772 charging connector. No DC fast charging for this plug-in hybrid. From this angle, you can see that the greenhouse does pinch in towards the rear, as we find in a lot of high-efficiency vehicles that really improves the aerodynamics as things go to the back. No windshield wiper on this really practically horizontal rear end either. The other thing you'll notice that we found in previous Priuses was a second window right back here in this area that does have the effect of really dropping rear visibility because this window's pretty high, the hatch is fairly high, and now you can no longer see through this area, but we now have an LED light bar that runs from one side to the other, full LED taillights, including the turn signals. A power hatch is available, but this particular model has a manual hatch to it, and other than that, nothing really funky to report back here. Well, okay, there is one thing funny back here. It's the Beyond Zero logo right in front of the Prime. Beyond Zero is what Toyota is calling all of their alternative fueled vehicles, from hydrogen to battery electric to, yes, plug-in hybrid vehicles like this. My thought on this is that this is literally before Zero because it still runs on gasoline if you want it to. Under the hood, we find the fifth generation of Toyota's hybrid system and the third generation of the Prius plug-in system. At its core, we find a two-liter four-cylinder hybrid engine that's basically the same one that we see in a variety of different Toyota hybrids. Under this hood, it produces 150 horsepower, 139 pound-feet of torque. It's mated to two different motor generator units on this side of the engine bay and a planetary gear set. Those three things together act like a transmission, and of course, because it has a big electric motor to make that hybrid system work, they can just power it off of the bigger battery pack in the rear. 161 horsepower is the rating for MG2 in this vehicle, and the battery in the back is a 13.6 kilowatt hour lithium ion pack. Total, that gives you 220 horsepower and 52 to 48 miles per gallon, depending on the trim you're in, and 44 to 39 miles of all electric range for a grand total of 600 miles of bladder busting driving. The one downside to choosing the Prius with the plug is that you can't get E all wheel drive because there's no room in the back for that electric motor. That's where the battery pack is living. So if you live in an area that gets snow, you're gonna have to choose. Do you want the all electric 44 miles of range and the really quick 6.5 to 6.6 .6 second zero to 60, or do you want all-wheel drive? And yes, you heard that right. 6.5 to 6.6 .6 seconds is the manufacturer estimate to this. That's about what we've been getting out here. I'll talk more about that in the drive section. And of course, stay tuned because hopefully I'll be able to have this at home for full testing just as soon as possible.
To charge the bigger battery in the rear, there's an onboard 3.5 kilowatt AC level 2 charger that is on the slow side for a plug-in hybrid. You will find some with 6.6 .6 kilowatt chargers. But you'll still be able to get this battery from zero to completely full in about 3.5 to 4 hours. And it's right in line with the direct competitor to this, which would be the Nero plug-in hybrid. But it's not going to look like this. It is not a sleek, sexy sedan. It's more of a pragmatic plug-in hatch. It also won't give you the range or fuel economy we find in here. 33 miles of electric range, 48 miles per gallon once that electric range is consumed, but the interior is a bit more practical. An interesting feature that's going to be available on the new Prius Prime is this 185 watt solar roof. Now obviously this cannot be combined with the glass see-through roof since these are opaque solar panels, but this is really an interesting twist. According to Toyota, this could get you about 700 miles of free EV driving per year, assuming your car is parked out in the sun like it is right now. This is only a 185 watt solar panel though, so if the battery is completely empty, it would theoretically take about 14 days to completely charge the battery in the summer down here in Southern California. But it's certainly going to mean that if you go away for a trip and your car's parked at the airport, you can either come home to a more full battery than you left, or at least you won't have to worry about the 12 volt battery draining. Does charge the high voltage battery in the Prius Prime. So this is a little bit different than some of the solar panels that Toyota's used in the past. Front seat comfort is pretty similar to the regular Prius and pretty average for the compact sedan category. In this top end trim, we have a power driver seat with two way adjustable lumbar support no memory settings for the driver over here, and a manual seat for the passenger. Some folks have been a little bit confused by the LCD instrument cluster and steering wheel setup that we find in this, and of course the Toyota BZ4X that I usually call the Busy Forks. That's Toyota's EV. Here's what's going on. The instrument cluster is really high on the dashboard, and you're meant to look at it over the top of the steering wheel, so you don't move the steering wheel up like that and try and peer through this little gap. You're supposed to move it down like that. It feels a little bit unnatural at first, but it does result in having the steering wheel in a very comfortable position and having your eye line brought closer to the road with that instrument cluster higher above. We'll take a look at that design in a bit. Hopping into the back, legroom is pretty good for a compact vehicle. I have maybe two to three inches of legroom with the front seat comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall. If I scoot over to this side, this seat is all the way back in its tracks. My knees are just about touching the seat back, but still a reasonable amount of room. The issue for some folks is going to be headroom back here. If I try and put my head back here to the headrest, it hits the ceiling before it hits the head restraint back there. And my hair is certainly brushing the ceiling in any sitting position. You will find a little bit more room in some of the competition, but honestly not much. Even though we do have that sexy profile, this is going to be similarly roomy to the Elantra, the Civic, the Corolla, etc but not as roomy as Priuses have been in the past. This model has a dual pane moonroof though, so rear passengers at least get somewhere to look. Behind the lift gate, we find just under 21 cubic feet of cargo capacity, which is a little less than we find in the regular Prius. That comes in at about 23.8. We still have this foldable style, or I guess a fold in half style cargo cover rather than a roller style shade back here. And of course, we still have the practicality of the liftback design where you could shove your IKEA furniture in here, surfboards, skis, things like that, absolutely no problem. The rear seats fold in a 60-40 fashion, but you'll notice that we can no longer put 22-inch roller bags in this position and still close the hatch. The cargo area has shrunk just a little bit too much in this generation. Now, part of that is, of course, because of the sexier profile, and the rest is because of the battery pack, which is mostly located back here. Let's go in for a closer look. Under the floor, we find the standard single voltage EVSE that comes with the vehicle. This is probably going to be okay for most shoppers because you can completely charge the battery overnight. And then we have a lot of foam divider going on here. If I pull out the foam divider, you'll notice that uh, we don't have a lot of room under here because the battery pack is located under that area of the vehicle. Over on this side, we find the high voltage charger, 3.5 kilowatts. And on this side, we find the 12 volt battery. The majority of the Prime's interior is shared with the regular Prius, except for a few trim differences here and there. Bearing in mind we're in the XSE trim, we have this dual pane moonroof setup with separate shades for the front and rear, but neither of these glass panes open, and obviously you can't combine this with the solar roof. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts and two way adjustable headrests. The seats are upholstered with imitation leather, and you can see that we have a tritone color scheme going on for the front seats that doesn't translate back to the rear seats. But here we have a dark red section, a light red section, and then the charcoal intersection. 
We have perforated center sections of the seat back and seat bottom cushions, although in this trim, they're not ventilated, but that is available if you get the top end XSE premium trim. Moving on over to the front doors, we find a decent percentage of soft touch materials, mostly on the upper section of the door and the armrest, and then hard plastics down there at the bottom of the door to help improve durability. The dark red trim on the dashboard is the biggest differentiator between this and the regular Prius. We also, of course, have that red ambient lighting strip running across the dashboard. The regular Prius has very similar trim components and ambient lighting as well. It's just not red like we find in this model. The upper section of the dashboard is hard, the midsection is soft, and then down here we find a pretty typically sized glove compartment for a compact sedan. I wasn't able to fit an 11-inch tablet computer inside, but some smaller ones might fit. Front and center in the dashboard is this enormous LCD infotainment system. As you can see, it supports full screen smartphone integration, wireless or wired, your choice. And the screen runs the same software that we find in other Toyota and Lexus vehicles. With the menu over here on the left side, it's a pretty flat design. Some vehicle settings and energy flow diagrams right there, but it's pretty easy to navigate, although it's not as fully featured as some. Below that, we have the controls for the single zone automatic climate control and some air vents, also the engine start stop button there. USB input and USB charge port right there, both USB-C. In this little area where I have my glasses, it's a tray where you can actually open that up and stick some knickknacks right there under out of the prying eyes. Two large cup holders right there. I have my smartphone connected to the system right now because that's my preference. Down here we have a joystick style shifter. B is for the aggressive engine braking or regen mode, but this doesn't have one pedal driving. Over here we have the Qi wireless charging slot. You can see there's an Android phone in a thicker case and it's charging just fine. Over here we have the various ways to control the hybrid system. These two buttons are a little bit confusing because this one switches between auto mode and EV mode. This one switches between hybrid mode and EV mode. So there are two different ways to get in the dedicated EV mode. EV mode, pretty self-explanatory. EV all the time. Hybrid, pretty self-explanatory. It's a save mode. Auto mode is going to prioritize the battery, but also use the engine when needed. Over here, we have a drive mode toggle. This basically affects the throttle mapping as well as the steering boost. Over here, we have brake hold, stability and traction control, and an electric parking brake. Then, of course, we have that charge mat over there again. Pretty softly padded armrest right there that opens to reveal a somewhat small storage area underneath. It's not terribly deep, but it is nice and long. Two more charge points inside. In case you're wondering, this is the new Prius's key. We don't have a power hatch in this model, so we just have lock, unlock, and the panic button. I think the general design is a bit more attractive than what we find in the BZ4X. I think it mainly has to do with the trim around that display and how it's integrated into the dashboard. Now again, you're supposed to be looking at that display over the top of the steering wheel like this. So the camera's right about at my eye line, and that means that that LCD instrument cluster, instead of being down here, is positioned closer to your eye line as you're driving. We have some pretty typical hybrid and plug-in hybrid displays, turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions, media readouts, things like that, trip computer. Certain vehicle settings are done with this display, but the theme generally does not change. You'll notice that dial sort of looking thing over here. It's a charge, eco, and power gauge at the top, fuel level over there, battery level right there on that side. And aside from just a slight color change as we move into sport mode or normal or eco mode, there really isn't any design change on this display. The steering wheel is very similar to what we find in the BZ4X. It has a slightly smaller diameter than average for this segment and pretty close in buttons here as well. These are the controls for that multifunction LCD cluster with the back button, dedicated phone button, volume toggle, and voice command button. On this side, we find track forward, backward mode, and then the controls for the standard radar adaptive cruise control and the aggressive lane keep assist system. This is part of the driver monitoring system that we find in this trim. These two little LEDs are not visible to the naked eye, but they're giving out IR so that way the system can see your eyes and see whether you're paying attention to the road as you're driving along. It will then complain if you're looking at the side of the road a little bit too much. Now for me, I found that a little bit distracting because if as a driver, for instance, I'm looking over here at maybe a freeway exit, I can still actually pay attention to what's going on over here, but the car starts beeping at you because you're looking for that exit. Out on the road, the Prius has done more than turn over a new leaf. As is obvious when you step on the gas pedal, you will actually get a little bit of front wheel slip here and there. And zero to 60 times in here are actually gonna be really similar to a Honda Civic Si. That is absolutely nutso when we're talking about a Prius. According to Toyota, this should run zero to 60 in about 6.5 to 6.6 .6 seconds, thanks to the extra torque that we get from the bigger electric motor up front. 
Most of that, of course, has to do with the battery, because the design of this hybrid system is basically the same as the regular Prius. We just have the ability to power that motor more because we have the bigger battery pack in the rear. Now, obviously, your zero to 60 times are going to depend on the drive mode that the vehicle is in. If it's in hybrid mode, even if the engine's off, zero to 60, six and a half to 6.5 seconds every time. If, however, I move this control over to EV mode, where it's actually going to exclude the gasoline engine, even if I floor it, full EV mode, fully on the gas pedal right there, then 0-60 to 60 should stretch out to maybe 11 or 12 seconds. Unfortunately, I don't have any official 0-60 to 60 timing, but that feels about right for what we're experiencing down here in San Diego. I also don't have any official 60 to 0 stopping distances, but you can bet this is going to be ever so slightly longer than the regular Prius, which is still a definite improvement over Priuses in the past, and handling is also definitely better. In fact, this is very impressive out on winding roads like this. I would never have thought that a Prius could be as fun as even a regular Honda Civic, let alone something like a Civic Si, but the comparisons are really interesting. Here, same acceleration time as a Civic Si, of course we get the CVT-like drone from the hybrid system, personally I don't mind that because we're going 0-60 to 60 pretty quickly, and then of course we're getting over 40 miles per gallon even without the battery pack being involved. But obviously stopping distances and handling numbers are going to fall behind the Civic Si and even the regular Civic 1.5 liter turbo, mainly because of the added weight of the battery pack we find on board of the Prius Prime. But I have to say they've done a really good job masking that extra weight. In some plug-in hybrids they can feel definitely rear end heavy, especially when you're on broken pavement in the corners the rear suspension can get a little unsettled, like the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid that we just got as a long term. But in the Prius Prime, the rear suspension feels just as settled as the regular Prius, definitely an improvement over the previous generation. In fact, every generation of Prius has really set the bar a little bit higher for the most fuel efficient car in America. Now's a good time to talk about the various drive modes. The most important switch is the one that allows you to choose between hybrid mode, EV mode, and auto mode. In auto mode, if you have a full battery pack, it's going to prioritize power from the battery, but if I floor it, it's going to turn on the gasoline engine because it thinks you want maximum acceleration. In EV mode, it's going to prioritize the battery until the battery is either too hot or you've really been exceeding that power output for too long. But even when floored, it's going to just be in EV mode. So 0 to 60 around 11 or 12 seconds or so. Hybrid mode is basically a save mode. So if we engage hybrid mode, instantly the engine's going to turn on because we're cruising here at 46 miles an hour. Of course, if I floor it, I'm going to get all 220 horsepower. Which mode is right for you is really going to depend on how badly you want to stay in EV only mode. Auto mode is again going to prioritize the battery, but if I floor it, it's going to turn on the gasoline engine because it's assuming you want all 220 horsepower. And for me, that's the most logical mode to be in. However, some folks are offended by the fact that a plug-in vehicle like this can't just stay in EV mode, which is why we get that lockout selection in those controls. Now, aside from that, the other drive modes, normal, eco, sport, etc., they're not really going to have any impact on 0 to 60 acceleration. And because this doesn't have an adaptive suspension system, it's not going to have any effect on the handling or ride quality either. Really, all those drive modes are going to do is adjust the throttle tip-in, so exactly how much oomph you get from the drivetrain based on the throttle position. That's really just a personal preference thing. A little bit less of a personal preference is likely going to be the sound deadening in the cabin. This is just about the same as the regular Prius, so if we're in hybrid mode, you're definitely going to get a decent amount of engine noise in the cabin. And even in EV mode, you're going to hear the motors more, really, than in any other battery electric vehicle that I can think of at the moment. This is pretty much average for a compact vehicle in the US. Think something like a Hyundai Elantra or of course Toyota's own Corolla. The amount of sound deadening in here is substantially similar to that, but the price tag of the Prius and the Prius Prime is a little bit higher. So you will certainly find more refinement in terms of the cabin noise in something like a Camry or an Accord than this, even though the price tag of this is actually above a decent number of Camrys. Fuel economy is a bit difficult to divine, but even driving this hard, it has been one of the most fuel efficient vehicles we have ever tested. Over this day of mixed driving in EV mode, it's been averaging 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour, even though we've been flooring it pretty much everywhere. And in hybrid mode, we've been getting over 45 miles per gallon. Obviously for my official fuel economy test scores, you should wait till I get this at home. But it's pretty logical that in steady state highway driving, there's not going to be a huge difference between this and the regular Prius. So you could easily expect 50 miles per gallon out on the open highway as long as you keep your speeds in check.
A perennial benefit of this kind of hybrid system is that fuel economy is still excellent at higher speeds, say 75 or 85 miles an hour, like you can legally drive in some states like Texas. Now, clearly at 85 miles an hour, fuel economy is going to be a lot lower than at 55 miles an hour, but the difference between this and a regular Corolla, that gap really starts to widen as you get up to those higher speeds. So this is still going to be considerably more efficient than average, even at 85. And that's not what we see in some of the serial hybrid systems out there, like the Honda hybrids or the Mitsubishi hybrid. In those systems, you will really notice that the fuel economy will radically drop off as you get to those higher speeds. Not so in the Prius or the Prius Prime. I never thought this statement would cross my lips, but this Prius is the craziest combination of features. Zero to 60, like a Civic Si, fuel economy, like a Prius, quite naturally, electric range, like you'd expect out of someone else's plug-in hybrid, because Toyota had been really dedicated to very short-range plug-in hybrids. That is very, very rational on a resource utilization front and, of course, a fuel efficiency front. But they've decided to go in a very different direction with this Prius. There is so much power, you definitely get a lot of torque steer right from a standstill. When you put everything together, the plug-in Prius is unquestionably the most fun Prius, and that's also something I never thought I would say. If you're looking to get your hands on the new Prius Prime, these should be on dealer lots this summer, so be sure and reach out to your Toyota dealer now. And be prepared to pay about $5,000 more than the regular Prius. It's going to start at $32,350, and there are only going to be three trims, SE, XSE, and the XSE Premium trim. XSE is what we're driving right now. This is $35,600 plus a few options that are available. The XSE Premium takes things up to $39,170 plus a destination charge right around $1,100. Any way you slice it, that's about $5,000 more than the regular Prius, but you do get about 40 miles of all electric range. Fuel economy, depending on how you drive it, is going to be pretty similar. This is EPA rated lower than the regular Prius, but depending on your terrain and the way that you drive, you may either get slightly better fuel economy or about the same. In previous generations of the Prius Prime, I averaged slightly better fuel economy on my commute, for instance, because it was able to regenerate power going downhill, and I live up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass. So in those driving conditions, the extra capacity of the battery may actually be an asset. But there are a few things to consider. No all-wheel drive, smaller cargo area than we find in the regular Prius, and of course, something like the Kia Nero, but we get that much faster zero to 60 time, which is, again, the really interesting twist with this generation Prius. It's not just better looking, it's better to drive as well, better handling, and significantly faster. I never thought that there would ever be a Prius that would win a stoplight race with a Honda Civic Si, but that is this Prius. You might be able to roast your clutch in your Civic Si and get about as fast as a Prius, but nine out of 10 times, this Prius is gonna beat you to 60 and beat you to 100 practically every time. Now, at this point in time, the other thing to know is that we are unsure how plug-in hybrid tax credits might apply to the Prius Prime. Because as I was recording this video today, there was just an agreement signed between the United States and Japan, which may allow Japanese manufactured plug-in hybrids and EVs like this to qualify for some portion of the federal tax credit. Whether or not that actually ends up applying to the Prius Prime is anybody's guess. However, you may be able to get some portion of the tax credit if you lease one. Obviously, there's still a lot of details that are unknown about that, but that could level that price tag and that price comparison off a little bit. If this has a future with a tax credit on it, it might actually be less expensive than a regular Prius. And that would certainly put this at a significant advantage. And I'm not talking about the all-wheel drive Prius. I'm talking about comparably equipped front-wheel drive models. The last thing you should know, of course, is that this comes only in SE, XSE, and XSE Premium trims. That's quite a mouthful. So the styling of the vehicle and the suspension tuning is a little bit different than the LE-focused range in Toyota's lineup. This is something that we've seen from them for a while. Basically, the more luxury or softer-tuned lineup is the regular side. Prime ends up being the sportier trim, as we see in some of the hybrid lineups as well. So two things definitely to keep in mind. How this compares against a Kia Nero? Again, you'll have to wait to the full video on all those details, but I think it compares quite well. We get a cargo area that is pretty similar, a bit more practical in the Nero, a bit more headroom in the back of the Nero, but a lot less fun to drive. And even though the Nero hybrid has been pretty reliable, if I were to bet on future reliability, something to drive 300,000 miles without too much trouble, the odds probably are in the Prius's favor, just because of the design of the hybrid system. However, if you prefer something that feels more like a traditional automatic transmission vehicle, 
you're gonna want the Nero because that's essentially what's going on there. It has a pretty traditional six-speed dual clutch under the hood. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section, and of course, hit the subscribe button because there will be a full review of this just as soon as I can get this at home, run it through official zero to 60 testing, handling testing, and of course, find out exactly how loud the cabin is. Again, keep in mind, this is essentially a $35,000 to $40,000 car in its upper end trims, but the cabin is not going to be as quiet as something like a $35,000 to $40,000 Camry or Accord. On the other hand, significantly better fuel economy and that really long electric range. Let me know about that, and I'll see all of you later.